So, well, this morning we continue our study of John. We are in the 18th chapter. Um, I want to remind you, though, as we as we read the Bible, we are reading history. I don't know if you're a fan of history or a history student, but uh, the Bible is a book of history. Real people, real events. From Genesis to Revelation, it's, it's, it's history. It's past, present, and it's future history. But it's all history. Uh, all of Christian theology is drawn from this history that we're given. There's a lot of confusion about, about theological truth and, and where it comes from. You know, a lot of the world religions try and search for truth. They find it, with they think, within themselves or whatever, and people think it's some mystical revelation of truth to them or whatever. And, and that, is, uh, that is not true. We saw last week, we talked about when Pilate said, what is truth? And we talked about Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's the truth. The truth is the scripture. That's the real truth. People can have opinions, but that's not the truth. And, uh, and all of this, um, it's all outside of you and outside of me. It's not found within ourselves. It's found in the Word of God. The theology is drawn from that. It, the theology is drawn from the watching God's faithful acts unfold through history. And that's where theology is, is developed from in the words of Scripture and um, the, the teachings of, um, of Paul and others along the way. Um, so uh, history, and, and uh, we know all of that because God has acted in history. That's how he revealed himself to us. It says in the Old Testament he revealed through prophets and, and, and things, but in the New Testament that he revealed himself through Jesus Christ. Through that, And we have the historical account. We have four Gospels that recount the, the life of Christ uh, in all of that, that are kind of the high point. But from Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, all the way through, it's, it's history. It's not poetry and fantasy and analogies, parables. Those things are present in that. But it's real events and real places and real time with, you know, we can track down the dates and know all. The, it's an amazing thing that we have um, in the history. So here, this morning, we're in uh, the years 30 A.D. We know that. We're in a real place. It's Jerusalem, city that's still there. <laughs> Places in history that we know, they're real people. The country is Israel. We're in the southern part of Israel and in, um, in Judea. They are, there are many players in the events that surround the death and resurrection of Christ. And uh, there's, of course, the disciples and, and the, the Jewish leaders and, and the, the, the Jewish people, the crowd that's there. The high priests, Sadducees, the Pharisees, that's all, we know all of the, the, the Jewish group that are, that are there, uh, those people. But then there are the Romans and the Roman soldiers and the, and, uh, the Roman executioners and the Roman governors. There's Pilate. Uh, and, and those are real people, real historical events. They can, you can look it up and you find those people in, in history for that. And uh, so we have all of that working as God's working, his redeeming. Um, purposes through through Christ, and so it's shortly after sunrise on on the on this morning, the day that we will come to know as Good Friday. It's Friday morning. It's early. It's sunrise there at this point, and sometime after midnight, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and was taken before Annas, the father of the current high priest, and then on to Caiaphas, who was uh, the the high priest at the day, and the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. They went through the trials. We've looked at that already, and they carried out their illegal middle-of-the-night trials. At sunrise, they got together real quick because it's illegal for them to have a trial at night, and they said, okay, we're going to sentence him to death. They did that right after sunrise and rushed him over because they need the Romans to do it. They rushed him over to Pilate. And so we saw the three religious uh, phases of the trial, and then we go to the Gentile steps. We looked at him before Pilate. We, we started that last week before Pilate, the Roman judge, the Roman governor at the time. Um, that was phase one of Jesus' initial hearing before Pilate. Um, that hearing comes at the end of uh, verse 38 in chapter 18. We saw that Pilate determined that there were no valid charges. He said, I, I find no basis for a charge. Um, charges against this man. Uh, in other words, not guilty. There's, there's nothing here. There's no case. There's no crime. 
He says, uh, you've produced no witnesses. There's been no testimony. There's no evidence. And uh, in spite of that, the Jews weren't done yet. And uh, they press the issue. So we pick it up in verse 39 of chapter 18. And so uh, and Pilate is speaking and, uh, to them, and he continues. He says, but it's your custom for me to release to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna back up just a little bit in this. Um, in the trial before Pilate, he'd gone back in in verse 37. And he said, you were a king then, he says to Jesus. Jesus answered, you're right in saying I'm a king, but in fact for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. And that's where we left off last week. But this... But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at a time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. I'm going to stop right there. In your Bible... Between verse 38 and 39, what do you see? Some white space, right? That's it. <laughs> well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke also, of course, give an account of this, of the events that were happening there. And uh, they all record the crucifixion of, of Christ and the, the things that were going on there. And, and so this morning we're going to look at a little bit of some of the other things that happen in that, in that white space, if you will, um, the Romans, the Jews needed Jesus crucified. They, 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 thought, they thought that it would protect them because they were afraid that the Jewish leaders were afraid the crowds would come after them. Jesus was popular. They were worried about those events. They wanted the Romans to be responsible for this. And uh, that was their plan. What they didn't realize is God's plan was that the Romans would crucify Jesus also, that they would have a role. Though the, G, the Jews were responsible for bringing Christ and, and pushing for his execution, the physical part of the execution happens by Romans, but it only happens to fulfill prophecy because Christ said that he would be lifted up. And he says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And that, that was a prophecy of how he would die. The Romans killed people by crucifixion. They lifted them up. The Jews, the Jews when, they, when they executed people, they threw them down and stone them, but Christ is lifted up in his execution. So these guys all think they have a plan going, and all they're doing is fulfilling this scripture in, in what will happen. The Jews are responsible, responsible for this and bringing uh, the charges and, and, and uh, bringing Christ. But immediately then in the book of Acts, we know that the apostles began to preach in Jerusalem and evangelize the Jews, and they repented, and thousands came, right? 3,000 that first day, and every day after that came and, and uh, repented and, and uh, became Christians in that. But, um, so, so all of this is unfolding, and it's not because the Jews hated Jesus, and it's not because the Romans were trying to keep peace and all these things. It was because God had sent a Savior into this world. And His plan was that that perfect Lamb would be sacrificed on that Passover day. And so all of the other events that are happening are happening in accordance to the plan of God. He didn't make these people do this, but he knew what they would do. <laughs> and God's plan is unfolding um, in a miraculous way. Um, so uh, Peter even says in Acts chapter 2, and I just read that passage, right, about uh, our scripture reading, that he says, men of Israel, what, that this man was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men. But, he says, but that was part of God's plan because without the sacrifice of Christ, there would be no salvation for man. So um, that's what's going on. And so if you want to lay an ultimate responsibility to, at the feet of who, well, who, 
who killed Jesus? Well, God did. In his plan, God the Father had a plan. Uh, it's hard to fathom how great that love is for us that he would put his son through such, uh, such a, a, an event. And what great love that Christ showed to us that he willingly took those steps forward. Uh, so we see the, 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 through this passage, all of this happening. Pilate said, look, I, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Um, but the Jews keep pushing. They need, they need Pilate to say guilty. They need Pilate to say, I'll execute this guy. Uh, he's not going to do that at this point. And so that's where we get to this blank space between verse 38 and verse 39. So your homework today is go home and read Matthew chapter 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke 23. You can see how all of this folds together in the Gospels, that they fit perfectly together. Because what happens in that time between verse 38 and verse 39 is that Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, right? Remember he was... That, that Jesus before Herod, well, if you look at John's account, you don't see that in here. That wasn't part of John's purpose in this, in, in showing what was happened. So it's not included in his gospel. But the others include, include this uh, deal. Herod's close by. Um, Pilate ships Jesus over to that because Pilate keeps saying not guilty. I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with what you're trying to pull off here. He knew the Jews were, the Jewish leaders were, it was out of envy <laughs> and out of fear that they wanted to get rid of Jesus because he's done nothing wrong. I'm not going to be a part of this. So I'll send him to Herod. Well, Herod turns the whole hearing into a, a circus. He's mocking, makes mocking things at Jesus. Just show me some miracle, right? Remember, he just wants Jesus to do some trick for him. In the middle of the mockery, they, they, uh, they throw a, a robe around Jesus and, and purple and, and they mockingly bow before him and spit on him and do things before the long way. And Herod, it becomes a mockery of Jesus Christ. And that entire time that he's there and Herod uh, scorns and ridicules Christ and then he sends him back to Pilate. Um, after mocking, laughing at him. So that's what's, that's what's happened in him. Pilate's already tried to get rid of him back in chapter 18, verse 31. Remember when they brought him? And uh, he said, you take him and kill him. The Jews were, were, were not permitted by Rome at that point to per, do executions, but Pilate even gave him permission. You guys, go ahead. You have the right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do that. If you want him executed, you go execute him. All right? He, he tried to get he tried to get out of it then back in um, uh, chapter eighteen verse thirty one he he tries to get out of uh, out of this again by sending Jesus to Herod hoping Herod will do something uh, but Jesus Herod sends him back um, and so we reach the final phase or the third phase then of the Gentile trial he started before Pilate went to Herod he's back now that's where verse thirty nine kicks in. All Paul, Pilate wants to do is, is somehow get out of this thing with some semblance of, of nobility. Beginning with verse 39, and we'll go down through verse 16, actually, of chapter 19. We're going to see that Pilate has three failed proposals. He, keep coming, proposals. he keeps coming up with some kind of a proposal, a way he can get out of this, some way he can remove himself from responsibility. Because even though he's not a great guy, he, he does have some conscience, maybe, he, of, of what is right and wrong. He is, he is charged by Rome to carry out the law. You know, hey, if you're going to do an execution, you better have a reason, right? And to, to, to tell Caesar, you better have a reason for Rome. And he says, I don't have any reason. So the failing proposals pick up in verse 39. He knows Jesus is innocent. He knows the whole thing is a plot by the Jewish leaders to have Jesus murdered. He knows it's out of envy. Jesus isn't a criminal, and he's not a threat to Rome. You know, he's not, he's not done anything. He's, he said, pay unto Caesar. What's Caesar's, right? He's, he, Jesus has paid his taxes. He's had his disciples. We know that. He, remember the, the 
the fish and the coin in the fish's mouth. And he had his disciples pay their taxes. He said, we pay our taxes. We do our thing. He's not trying to lead a rebellion against Rome. Um, but the dilemma is clear here. We talked last week that Pilate had messed up a couple times, and the Jews had already gone to Caesar and told on him. He was on thin ice <laughs> in his job. He knew that that with Caesar, with uh, Tiberius was the, the Caesar at the time, that, that he knew that losing your job with Tiberius didn't mean you got fired and went and looked for another job. Usually it meant you lost your life when you lost your job with him. And uh, Pilate's afraid. He's afraid of losing his power. He's afraid of losing his job. He's afraid of losing his life. And at the same time, he's getting pressured by these people to do something with this guy named Jesus. And if you don't do this, right? Remember what they say? If you're no friend of Caesar, if you don't, if you don't do this, you're no friend of Caesar. And he's thinking, they're going to go tell on me again and I'll be in trouble. What am I going to do? That's where he's at. You ever been in that situation where it's like I'm pressured on this side and this side to make everybody happy? And there's no way I can make everybody happy at the same time? That's kind of where he was at in this kind of deal. He's trapped um, in, in where he's at. He's trying to get them to, to uh, take Jesus himself and, and do that. In Mark chapter 15, he tells us that Pilate had developed a custom that he might ingratiate himself to Jews. He didn't have a good relationship with the Jews, and so he started this deal. And just to tell you what, every year at your Passover feast, you can pick what criminal you'd like to be released. Because some of these guys, they wouldn't, of course, pick a violent criminal, but some of these guys were in jail because they had done something against Rome, right? The Jews didn't care about that. They're like, so they would pick someone each year. Mark 15 tells us that was the, that Pilate had instituted that to be kind of a gesture of goodwill to the Jews. He gave the people the right to choose on that. And uh, the, so the crowd is gathered outside of the palace. Jesus has been in front of Pilate. He says, no, not guilty, no charges. And Herod, Herod says, he back, says, I'm not messing with him. It's your problem. The crowd's gathered there. Pilate thinks to himself, maybe this is the right time to let them pick. This is the time right here. And uh, so in, in uh, verses 39 and 40 there, we see that where he says, he says to them, but it's your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. He's got both these guys here. He walks out onto the, the portico, the porch, overlooking the crowd. He's got Barabbas here. He's got Jesus here. He says, so... Whom do you want me to release to you? King of the Jews? <laughs> nope. Mark tells us that, that, uh, that the chief priests stirred up the crowd in Mark 15, 11, that they stirred up the crowd to ask for Barabbas. You ever seen a crowd get out of control? We've watched any news over the last couple of years. You've seen that happen, right? We've seen the riots and the horrible things that have happened. What were those people thinking? Do you think that they that everybody in those crowds got up that morning and said, I think we're going to go burn down businesses today? <laughs> well, maybe a few of them. But they got involved with the crowd. Well, this is Satan is working among the crowd. He's working among these people. He says, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. We don't want that. We want Barabbas. And they'll force the crowd up. And so when Pilate comes out and gives this choice, and by the way, there's a little bit of sarcasm when he says, you want me to release the king of the Jews? Pilate didn't think Jesus was a king. <laughs> he was using the title that had been given. Yeah, whoever, you want me? I'll, I'll read this is my way out. They won't pick Barabbas. If you go look in those other Gospels, like I said, in, in Luke 23, Mark 15, we go look and, and we find out more about Barabbas. This was a bad guy. He was part of, he'd been involved with some things, some people had been murdered, some other stuff. He was a dangerous guy. Would you want him walking the streets in your city? No. <laughs> so this is an easy deal. I'll give, him, I'll give him a murderer. I'll give him this guy. 
And this, besides, Jesus is the one that just, just a few days before they'd said, Hosanna, son of David, right? Blessed be the name of the Lord. All these things when he came riding into the city just a few days ago. Surely they'll pick him and I'll be off the hook. The crowd screams, Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. We want Barabbas. That's who we want. Even, even though he was, he was this horrible, despicable criminal guy, that's who they chose that day. Interesting thing about Barabbas, not only that he'd been involved in, in some terrible things, but look at the name of his, his name, Barabbas. What does that mean? Bar means son of. Uh, you might remember other places where we see that in Scripture. Simon Barjona, remember hearing that phrase? Maybe Simon, son of Jonah. That's what it meant. Another thing, right? Barjona, and that was the that was the that was the word. Bar, son of, son of. What does Abba mean? Abba means father, right? You know that, right? Son of, son of the father. That's what Barabbas' name literally means. Son of the Father. And so Pilate stands out in front of the people with the son of a human father here and the son of God on the other side of him. Whom do you choose? Who do you want released this day? What an amazing parallel in Scripture. God doesn't give us extra things in Scripture just for fluff. That name is important. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. This is the son of a human. <laughs> this is this is the son of mankind here. That's that's here. Well, there's the son of God. That's the choice. And that's the choice for each and every one of us. Whom do you choose? Which one are you going to choose? Are you going to follow man or are you going to follow God? That was. That was the question. That was given to the people. Matthew 27 tells us when they scream Barabbas, and Pilate says, what then should I do with Jesus called Christ? That question that all of us have to answer, what shall I do with Jesus who's called Christ? And the crowd screamed, crucify him. Crucify him. And Pilate's thinking, he, he can't get out of this mess. He releases Barabbas to appease the Jews, but he still has Jesus, this problem that he's dealing with. The crowd says crucify him. He has one more plan uh, in 19, chapter 19, verse 1. It says, Pilate then took Jesus and had him flogged. We'll see that next week as it unfolds. He thinks one more time, maybe if, if I just have him beaten, and the, when the people see that, that will be enough to appease them. Maybe that will get me out of this still. But that's where we're at. What are you going to do with Jesus? Who do you want? That's the question. Do you want the world or do you want heaven? That's the question. Do you want the son of a human father or the, or the son of God? Barabbas or Jesus? People make that decision every single day. You and I make that decision every day. If we're Christians, it's, it's part of uh, the temptation that we face in life, that we choose sin over, over, over not sinning, that we choose Barabbas over Christ. For the, for the world, it's about their salvation. What do they choose? Whom do you choose? Do you choose Barabbas or do you choose Christ? You choose the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what Jesus says. That's where the temptations come from. That's, who, that's all the places, you know, you know, people choose that in lots of ways. They, they choose it in their self-worship. They choose it in, their, in, in what prioritizes their time and what drives them to do the things that they do. I choose those things. What do you, am I going to do? He said, what are you going to do with Jesus called Christ? Peter said, there's no salvation in any other name than the name of Jesus. 
what will you do with him? That's the question. Most of us have, have uh, affirmed that decision. Romans 10 tells us, confessing with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believing your heart, God raised him from the dead. And we walk alive proclaiming Christ. We stumble and we fall in temptation. But we should choose him every day. Choose Jesus every day. Confess Jesus is Lord, your sins are forgiven. Refuse to do that. And you're ever condemned, forever condemned with those that crucified him. Father, what an amazing question that we're given in Scripture. Last week it was about truth and finding the source of truth. And this week it's about choosing whom we would follow. Amazing question that's given. And Father, we say, well, yeah, I've chose Christ. I'm a Christian. And yet sometimes we stumble and fall and we don't follow Christ. We choose, we choose the ways of the world and the ways of our Savior. And so, Father, give us the boldness to choose Christ each and every day in every situation that we would follow Him. Father, for those that don't know Him as Lord and Savior, we pray today that today would be the day of salvation. That we choose Christ. Follow the Son of God not follow man. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.